After days of heavy fighting, on November 5, 1942, the British Eighth Army smashed through the Axis defensive line at El Alamein, forcing the Panzer Army Africa into retreat. The British victory at El Alamein was a turning point of the war in North Africa, or, as Winston Churchill called it, the end of the beginning. In the days that followed, the Eighth Army began to pursue the remnants of the once fearsome Africa Corps along the Libyan coast. Meanwhile, on November 8, at the other end of North Africa, combined British and American forces landed in by then the largest amphibious invasion of the war on the shores of a Vichy France controlled colonies, Morocco and Algeria, in Operation Codenamed Torch, to close the other end of the pincer movement. After initial resistance, on November 10, Vichy authorities at the French colonies agreed on the armistice with the Allies, and all the fighting in Morocco and Algeria ceased. The Axis reacted promptly. Day after the armistice in North Africa, the German troops crossed the Vichy border, occupying the rest of France, in the next few days. On the same day, on November 11, the first German and Italian troops arrived at Tunisian airfields. Throughout November, transported by air or sea, the Axis brought more than 20,000 fresh troops to Tunisia, establishing a new force in Africa, the 5th Panzer Army. By the end of November, Tunisia was firmly in the Axis hands. The Axis occupied the country without firing a shot. Although Tunisia was one of the primary targets of Operation Torch, the Allies did not have sufficient troops and resources to land east of the Algerian capital. Consequently, the Allies had to cross the vast distance from Algiers to the Tunisian border in what became known as the Race for Tunis. Of the ground forces that took part in Operation Torch, the Allies formed a new unit, the 1st British Army, under the command of Lieutenant General Sir Kenneth Anderson. By late November, forward elements of the 1st Army reached the borders of Tunisia. The first Allies' attempt to take the Tunisian capital failed, as they faced stiff German resistance. Moreover, the Axis launched the counter-attack, pushing the Allies back to their starting position. Much of the credit for the Axis' success goes to the Luftwaffe. During this period, the Axis enjoyed local air superiority in the area. In November, the Luftwaffe transferred a significant number of aircraft from Sicily to Tunisian airfields. Stuka dive bombers and fighters constantly harassed the Allies closing to Tunisia and the shipping along the coast. On the other side, the Allies were in the process of transferring their air forces from Gibraltar into airfields in the vicinity of Algiers. Even that was not adequate, as Tunisia was barely within the range of the Spitfire fighters, while the American-built planes, with a greater operational range, were still available, only in small numbers. Furthermore, the rains that came in December, made Algerian airfields, almost unusable. Despite the heavy rains, the fighting continued throughout December. Both sides rushed to bring more reinforcements. By early December, the Germans completed the transfer of the 10th Panzer Division, which would become the backbone of the 5th Panzer Army. Attached to the 10th Panzer Division was a Panzer Abteilum 501, equipped with the brand new Tiger I tanks. The 10th Panzer Division and the Tiger tanks would play a major role in the battles to come. The Tiger I tank was a monster on the battlefield. With frontal armor up to 110 mm, Tiger was a true bunker on the wheels, almost indestructible by most anti-tank weapons allies possessed at that time. The main armament was the 88 mm gun, which could easily penetrate the frontal armor of any British or American tank from a distance of up to 2 kilometers. The only problem with early models were the frequent engine failures. After all, 
it took lots of horsepowers to move a vehicle of 56 tons. However, unlike November, when Axis transport in the Mediterranean was unopposed, in December, after the successful landings of Operation Torch, the Allies released many warships, used to protect the invasion fleet, into attacking Axis transport convoys. During December, Allied air and sea action, would sink a quarter of all Axis cargo, dispatched to Tunisia, including 30 panzers. Furthermore, unfortunately for the Axis, the events in Tunisia corresponded with the German catastrophe at Stalingrad. These events, overshadowed the struggle in North Africa. To prevent the collapse of the southern sector of the Eastern Front, the German High Command, directed almost all reinforcements into the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, the events on the Eastern Front, and naval raids, did not completely prevent the transport of troops and equipment. By January, the Axis troops in Tunisia, numbered 74,000 German, and 26,000 Italian soldiers. The 5th Panzer Army, began to take its final shape, and all it needed, was a proper commander. On December 8, General Hans-Jürgen von Arnim, arrived in Tunis, transferred straight from the Eastern Front's Rajef salient, where von Arnim, had been commander of the 39th Panzer Corps. He replaced General Walther Neering, the previous commander of the Africa Corps, who commanded the Axis contingent in Tunisia, during November. The Allies also had logistical problems of their own. The supply ports in Algeria, were hundreds of kilometers away from the front line. Overstretched supply routes, were under constant Luftwaffe attacks. The muddy roads, lack of transport vehicles and mechanical problems, also caused delays in the supply chain. Logistics was the main reason why the Allied troops in Tunisia, were so modest. Partially, the logistical problems, were also the reason why the 1st U.S. Armored Corps, under General George Patton, was still stuck in Morocco. To compensate lack of men, the Allies organized the French colonial units, scraped together from Morocco and Algeria into the 19th Corps, under General Louis Coltz. As the French still had a vivid memory, of the British attack, on the French fleet in Oran, two years ago, which disrupted relations between two countries, the French 19th Corps, was not under the direct command of the British First Army. However, the Corps remained under the command of the Allies' Supreme Commander in North Africa, General Dwight D. Eisenhower. The equipment of the French troops in Tunisia, was not suitable for modern warfare, as their primary role was to protect the colonies, from local insurrections. They lacked proper anti-tank guns, together with other supporting weapons or armor. However, they proved to be a reliable infantry force, most suitable for the patrol duties. Tunisian landscape, also proved as an obstacle. Especially, when the heavy December rains, brought the battle in Tunisia to a stalemate, and the mud, prevented almost any movement on the rugged, mountainous terrain. Apart from the narrow coastal plain, northern and central Tunisia are mountainous, with two main mountain ranges, the western and eastern dorsales. The road network, running from north to south, was in good condition. The few routes running from east to west, were much worse, with the most notable roads running through Kasserine and Spetelia passes in the western dorsales, and Fade in the eastern dorsales. All these routes, passed through mountainous terrain, so it was relatively simple, for them to be blocked by a defender, using the minimum number of troops. Both sides, held a long and thin line, with limited forces, unable to spare sufficient troops, for any major offensive. The overstretched battalions, covered the ground, usually held by the brigade-sized unit. There was no continuous front line. Instead, the small units guarded strategic points, most often on hilltops, so distanced from each other, and unable to provide any mutual support. By mid-December 1942, 
The Tunisian front line looked like this. The British V Corps, with the bulk of its forces formed of the 78th Infantry Division, and elements of the 6th Armoured Division, was on the north. The rest of the 6th Armoured Division, just recently disembarked in Algiers, was on its way to Tunisia. The French colonial troops, of the 19th Corps, were in the centre, while the 2nd US Corps, with its 1st Armoured, and elements of the 1st and 34th Infantry Division, was in the south. The Allies' positioning was flexible. Since the main Allies' effort, to break the Axis line came from the north, the French and American units, often reinforced the British V Corps, to form the small attacking parties. Moreover, the command structure, was also complex. Formally, these units were part of the British First Army. However, attempts to form an army, in a combat environment, proved to be challenging. By January 21, General Anderson, in reality, commanded only one incomplete corps, while General Eisenhower, remained in charge of the US and French contingent. On the other side, von Arnim divided his 5th Panzer Army, into three parts. The provisional unit, known as Division von Broek, formed mainly of the Luftwaffe parachute units, held the northern part of the front. The 10th Panzer Division, was in the middle, while its Panzer Force, served as the mobile reserve, capable of operating wherever needed. The Italian Superga Division, reinforced by the elements of various smaller German units, held the southern sector. On December 22, the Allies launched one more attempt, to seize the Tunisian capital. The attack was carried out, with limited forces in heavy weather, with a predictable outcome. By Christmas morning, the Allies had stopped with the attack. But everything changed in late January. After months of retreat, and two years after the Germans arrived in Africa, on January 26, the Africa Corps, left Libya. The Panzer Army Africa, under Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, retreated in relatively good order, being always a few days ahead of its pursuers. On the other side, the 8th British Army, under General Bernard Montgomery, during the pursuit, receiving supplies from Cairo by a single road, reached the limits of its supply lines. When the 8th Army, entered Tripoli on January 23, they had to stop to reorganize and resupply, before further advance. Nevertheless, the Axis now had at their disposal, newly arrived 30,000 German, and 48,000 Italian troops in Tunisia. More than enough, to change the balance of power. Von Arnim, finally had sufficient troops to launch an attack, and he didn't want to wait, knowing all too well, that the Allies were getting stronger every day. On January 30, he launched the attack on Fade Pass, held by French troops. The two battle groups of the 21st Panzer Division, that had just arrived from Libya, spearheaded the attack. In frontal attack, the 21st Panzer Division, suffered heavy casualties, however, they seized Fade Pass by night, forcing French troops into retreat. Because of the poor coordination between Allies, the American armored forces, arrived too late to help the French defenders, and their counter-attack, found the Germans well prepared in their defensive positions. The Germans, repelled the American attack with ease. Meanwhile, Rommel organized troops of the Panzer Army Africa into defensive positions on the French build Marath Line. The Marath Line, was a system of fortifications, built by France in southern Tunisia in the late 1930s, intended to protect Tunisia, against an Italian invasion from its colony in Libya. By 1943, the fortification system of the Marath Line deteriorated, but it was still a formidable obstacle, and the best place to stop the advance, of the 8th Army. Once in Tunisia, Rommel received news, that he had been relieved of his command, and replaced by Italian General Giovanni Messe. Furthermore, the Panzer Army Africa, changed its name and became the 1st Italian Army. 
As the reorganization and command handover prolonged, Rommel realized, that he would have another chance to redeem himself, and regain his old glory. Rommel knew all too well, that the Eighth Army would not be able to continue advancing, for the next few weeks. He came up with an ambitious plan, to launch a major offensive, on the line held by the Americans in the south, which posed a great threat, to his defense on the Marath line. He feared, that his forces on the Marath line, were in danger of being surrounded, if the Americans struck first. The ambitious plan, called for the major offensive, carried out with all available mobile units, including the Italian troops. Rommel's idea, was to penetrate the American line, to destroy the main Allies' supply depot at Tebessa, and swing right to Tala and threaten the British V Corps, from the flank. He knew, that he had insufficient troops to encircle the V Corps, but he hoped the British, would pull back to Algeria, once their flank was exposed. His idea, confronted von Arnim's, more defensive plans. Von Arnim, wanted to deal with the British V Corps on the north, to relieve the pressure on Tunis. His goal, was to consolidate the German line, and regain more suitable defensive positions, on hilltops of eastern Dorsales. Since von Arnim and Rommel, didn't like each other, and were in constant dispute, Supreme Commander of the German Army in the Mediterranean, Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, had to intervene. Kesselring, met with Rommel and von Arnim, on February 9, to reach agreements between the two commanders. After hearing both plans, Kesselring proposed a compromise. According to Kesselring plan, von Arnim, would exploit his success at Fade Pass, and continue with an advance towards Sidi Bozid, with 10th and 21st Panzer Divisions, in Operation codenamed Spring Breeze. Meanwhile, two days later, Rommel would launch a spoiling attack, with the rest of the Africa Corps, on the south, in a separate operation, codenamed Morning Breeze. Since Rommel forces, were too weak for such an attack, von Arnim, agreed to send 21st Panzer Division, back to Rommel's command, after he completed Operation Spring Breeze. In the early morning of February 14, Operation Spring Breeze began. The 10th Panzer Division, advanced hidden in sandstorm from Fade Pass, clearing isolated positions held by the troops of the 168th Regiment, of the 34th Infantry Division. Shortly after, the 21st Panzer Division, emerged from the south, raging havoc, among American troops. American tanks, sent to counter-attack advancing Germans, felt victims of the 88mm guns from the Tiger tanks, leading the way. By afternoon, American defenses at Sidi Bozid collapsed, and troops began to retreat in disorder towards Spetelia. Before nightfall, the two German panzer divisions, made contact at Sidi Bozid. The following day, Americans tried to organize a counterattack, with only one tank and an infantry battalion. The result of the attack, of such a small force, on two battle-hardened panzer divisions, is not hard to imagine. Both American units, were encircled, and gradually destroyed by superior German forces. Witnessing the destruction of two battalions, on February 16, demoralized American troops, began to retreat from Spetelia without orders. The 34th Infantry Division, disintegrated as a combat unit, and by night, the streets of Spetelia, were jammed by the fleeing troops and vehicles. Meanwhile, Rommel advanced from the south, facing virtually no resistance. The same day, von Arnim's troops entered Spetelia, after short combat with the retreating American troops. The success of the Operation Spring Breeze, and capture of Spetelia, left the gates of Kasserine Pass widely open. An opportunity for Rommel, presented itself, and was not, to be missed.